Hey there, welcome to Takeaway with Sam Okus, a podcast from Nation's Restaurant News. I am Sam Okus, Editor-in-Chief here at NRN, and this is the show where I give you an all-access pass to the restaurant industry's most influential decision makers. This week, I'm talking with Maria Rivera. She is the CEO of Smalls Sliders, an Atlanta-based chain with eight locations that was founded by Brandon Landry, who also started Walk-On's Sports Bistro. The two chains both count Landry and former NFL quarterback Drew Brees as as board members and as visionaries. But Maria, who was formerly the president over at Krispy Kreme, was brought in to be the brains behind Smalls to scale its operations and to lead it out from Walk-On's shadow. Uh, That process is already well underway as Smalls already has dozens of franchise agreements in place and is planning explosive growth across the U.S. That growth is helped along by a unique expansion strategy in which Smalls is having modular shipping container units built out off-site and delivered to their plots, which allows franchisees to get a restaurant open in eight to 10 weeks from the time they secure their real estate. Uh, Maria was a panelist in our recent Create Road show in Atlanta, and she and I met up the next day at Small's headquarters to talk about the brand's unique restaurants, which the company calls Cans, as well as how Small's Sliders is taking a page out of Walk-On's book while maintaining its own brand identity. In this conversation, you will learn more about why one product brands can be so iconic, why the simplification driving efficiency can be so hard, and which traits a CEO should possess if they want to quickly grow their business. By the way, if you like what you hear from this interview and you want to learn more from Maria, she's one of our many dynamic speakers who will be joining us at the Create Experience in Palm Springs, California this October 1st through 3rd. If you're looking for a more interactive and engaging restaurant event where you'll connect with hundreds of your peers in the industry, and let's face it, if you just want to enjoy the beautiful surroundings of Palm Springs, Create is the event for you. Head to create.nrn.com for more details and to register for this free and unique event. Jumping now into my interview with Smalls Sliders CEO, Maria Rivera. Also, don't forget to stick around after the interview as I will share my eight takeaways from this discussion, actionable insights that you can take with you on the go. For generations, Butterball has delivered only quality American-grown turkey. They provide products that please patrons while delivering versatility to operators in all segments. But Butterball doesn't stop there. As an organization, they're always looking for ways to empower operators to be at their best. From recipes that inspire culinary creativity to insights and trends that can help drive business decisions, it's all at ButterballFoodService.com. Okay, I am here with Maria Rivera, the CEO of Smalls Sliders. Uh, Maria, thank you so much for joining me today on the podcast. Uh, Pleasure to speak with you again. We last night had an opportunity to hang out with some folks in Atlanta here. Um, Now I am in the temporary HQ for Smalls in Atlanta. Um, And we're going to dig deeper on what this brand is all about um, because you guys are verifiably the next big thing. You guys, I said last night, you're going to have 20,000 locations. (laughs) I I, I believe it. I believe it. Um, But let's just start. Let's just start a little bit further back with your career, because you've been in this industry for many years. You have great experience, great resume. Tell me about how you got into the restaurant industry. Well, it happened by accident. Um, I was a a single mother, um, and at the time, I needed to do something with my life out of college. So I came to Florida. I applied at the Walt Disney Company. I got an hourly job, and the rest is history. Uh, So that's where I started my career. Started as a cast member. I was a cast member. I was a dishwasher, Okay. Uh, but they didn't call it dishwasher. They call it dish machine operator. Um, and I thought that was very sexy. I didn't know what I was doing. So I took the job and there was a, there I was in mm. a dish room. So um, was that your first food service experience? Did you just get the bug from there? First food service experience and the grease sort of got in my veins after that. Mm. But yes, I worked every hourly position that there has ever been written yeah. in a restaurant in all style, styles of service. So it's it's been quite the journey close to 30 years ago. 
Oh, congratulations. At, at what point did you know you had leadership potential? Because you've been a leader now in, in a few different brands. And I'll just say anecdotally, just seeing your team interact with you, there's a great reverence for your leadership of this brand, which is cool. I, w when did you know that that was in you? If you ask my sisters, it's been there all along. Mm -hmm. If you ask my parents as well. But I would say probably after my first year of doing an hourly role, um, I did a rotation through learning and development at the Magic Kingdom. So I was part of um, a cohort group that relaunched all of what you would see today as the training of of all hourly cast members for parks and resorts. Mm -hmm. That program has not changed. So we spent a year of our lives developing um, that new way of training. Okay. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah. So prior to Smalls, you were at Krispy Kreme, Perhaps. president of Krispy Kreme. Yeah. Um, and you get this opportunity for Smalls. To tell me about that moment for you. Why did this brand appeal to you? Well, I didn't know what to expect at first. I got a phone call from a colleague, a good friend of mine uh, that actually also had the search um, for the private equity and introduced me to the brand. And I love one product brand. So anybody that has worked with me knows that I have an affinity towards what I would say iconic one product brands. Mm. And it doesn't need to be iconic today, but that has the potential to become that. So I was at a crossroads of deciding if I wanted to be a CEO or if I didn't. You know, obviously, I spent wonderful years with a remarkable group of people at Krispy Kreme. Um, and when that chapter was coming to an end, I decided that it was an opportunity for me to step into the CEO role. Um, but I didn't know what to expect. Um, so I took a three-day trip, um, drove all the way, tasting every possible burger joint along the way, uh, all the way to the can in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, mm -hmm. uh, not expecting anything. I said, well, how good can a cheeseburger slider be? <laughs> to me, one product brands absolutely have to have the most craveable product in whatever space you're in. Cookie space or donut space or burger space, it has to be absolutely craveable and you have to be different. So when I drove into the Blue Bonnet location, I said, oh, okay, it's a recycled can on top of a modular building. Wait, <laughs> it doesn't look like anybody broke ground here. What, what do we have going on here? And then I was introduced by the um, squad member that was taking my order. I ordered a slider and she said, why are you having a slider? You need to have a Biggie Smalls. And I said, what is that? What is a Biggie Smalls? <laughs> so the rest is history. Fell in love with the product, said, wow, this is really remarkable. It's craveable, it's different. And it served out of this cool environment and that has no dining room. And um, so I, I had to process all of that. And then I sat in the parking lot for a good four hours and watched the car stack keep growing and growing. And I said, okay, this is something really special. Mm -hmm. And that's how we came together. I okay. mean, not without a lot of thinking on both sides, mm -hmm. right? Both on the private equity side and with Brandon and a lot of conversations with Brandon, who obviously is a founder of, of Smalls and just a remarkable restaurateur. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, if you have a great partner on the private equity side, a great founder and a great product and great people to work with, I think then you can do great things. Yeah. So jumping over to the other side of this equation and the, the Smalls brand itself, you mentioned uh, Brandon, of course, is Brandon Landry, the founder, who is also the founder of Walk Ons. Yes. So these two kind of started as sort of sister concepts, but I know have, you know, are, are kind of taking their own journeys. But um, for those unfamiliar with the Smalls, origin story and how it got to this point where you came in on as CEO. Tell us a little bit about the origin of the brand itself. So the brand is going to be four years old. I mean, well, the concept would mm -hmm. be four years old in a couple of months. Mm -hmm. So uh, the idea came to Brandon, you know, in, in typical Brandon fashion, he comes up with these things and then writes them down, puts them in a notebook, hides them somewhere. <laughs> but, you know, and then he has the next big idea. So, he came up, the, the can came to him before, or the name and the can came to him before the product. You know, he 
absolutely loves the sound a lot. So mm -hmm. you're killing me smalls, you're killing me smalls. So the, he had this idea of this great one product brand. Obviously in Baton Rouge, there's a lot of great founder stories. You have Raising Canes and Todd Graves, who's a personal friend of Brandon. So rest is history. Mm -hmm. had, he had a concept. Drew was a partner um, a, of Brandon's at Walk-Ons, believed, was the first person that believed in Smalls and decided to help fund the first location to see what the first location would do. The brand actually, the concept started in a mobile unit. Mm. A lot of people don't know that. We actually have that mobile unit sitting in Prairieville right now, but it's, it's starting a mobile unit mm -hmm. and during COVID, took food to people. Mm. So did a lot of good. Mm -hmm. So that word of mouth and that doing good really did marvelous things for, for them and um, opened the first location at incredible volumes uh, without any digital equity and um, then decided to open the second one. Same story. Opened the third one, started to franchise. And that's when Ten Point, who is also a partner at Walk-Ons, said, wait a minute, we want we want to come in and partner and help tell this story and grow it to its full potential. Yeah. At that point, they said, we have to invest in bringing the right team. And that's when the search for this role came about. Um, and once I agreed to do it, we sort of halted all franchising efforts until I came in, had an opportunity to evaluate um, capabilities, design the business model, understand how I wanted that operating model to work, mm -hmm. and then have time to build the team. And then we just reopened franchising to great success about 45 days ago. And it's just been insane ever yeah. since. Um, but that's how the brand started and mm. uh, the, the concept, I call it, because I think we're building a remarkable brand today. But, mm -hmm. you know, we had a great concept to start. I think the, the food is craveable. The people are fun. We have a unique way in which we're servicing it. The service model is a lot of fun, right? It's drive through and pick up window mm -hmm. aided by digital equities that we're establishing all served out of an 800 square foot container can. And that's why we call them cans. Yeah, that's a point of clarity I wanted to make. It Well, another point of clarity I think is important to make is when you say Drew, it's not just any Drew. That's Drew Brees, Hall of Fame quarterback from the New Orleans Saints, of course. So, yes, he's a friend of Brandon's and big partner in walk-ons. And I, it's funny because I'm, I'm staring at him right now because well, we can bring him people again. can't see this, but uh, we have a cutout. he and Brandon are standing in the corner as cutouts. Um, so that's very exciting. We did definitely think to put them uh, in line of the, of the video, but we did not do okay. that to spare everybody. But... Um, you mentioned that can aspect of it, and you guys call your stores, your units, your locations, you call them cans, and that's important because this is very important to the small story, which is the footprint. Yeah. Um, walk me through why this um, container, this can as you call it, is so important to the growth of smalls. I often say that the brand has two brains. Uh, one is, of course, what we would consider the traditional brain of the brand and product, um, what we're serving, if, if it's credible to the gas, you know, et cetera. Is it meaningful? But the can has its own brain, you know, and I think it's super innovative that we're servicing out of this 800 square foot modular. The team members, we call them squad members, but the team members came up with this whole can okay. uh, uh, story meaning they consider themselves can people. Mm. Think through the lens of we cook in a can, we sweat different in a can, life in a can, it's a lot of fun. So our own squad members who are all Gen Zs are teaching us very quickly how they want to feel inside mm. this environment. So we made a decision when I came on board to just say, we're not really restaurants, we're not really retail stores, we are building an omni-channel business model. What are we? Uh, well, they said, well, of course we're can people and we're cans. So it's now become very much a part of what we lead. The other part too is that these modulars are transported from the construction facilities, from the facilities in which we build them. And they travel literally on a double wide across mm. America. Mm -hmm. And we don't really break ground. We we literally in 27 minutes 
take it from the trailer and drop it in the pad and hook it to the pad, changing the landscape of a city and providing jobs to people. So it's such a cool story yeah. that we felt, you know, we needed to be distinctive and our people are telling us how they want to experience what they're called and the environment in which they work. Mm -hmm. Is there one form of can, one model of the can, or do you have multiple sort of models and prototypes of what the can can be? Well, we... The current locked-in prototype, which will evolve by next year, is what we are doing our pr full proof-of-concept testing and then obviously evaluating the ergonomics of the business to make it even more efficient than what it is, uh, going into what we call small 2.0. We do have different prototypes because, as I told you, the brand started in a, in a mobile unit. Right. So um, it started in in three shipping containers. So our first location, which is across LSU, is three shipping containers, okay. recyclable ship, shipping containers. And then the second location has the modular with the shipping container look that you see today. Mm -hmm. And then everything else that we've built, we've just made it more efficient. Mm -hmm. um, we use only half a parcel, right? So half an acre. So we, it all has to be really well defined inside um, this modular that drops with a full kitchen and restrooms <laughs> the moment it drops. That's amazing. It's a lot of fun. So there's, you guys have a, a manufacturing facility that's putting these together, shipping them out to where they need to go. Um, it, it's, I made a joke last night, but it's re really true about shipping containers. I mean, is there are there just a lot of shipping containers available? Because how do you get supply <laughs> for shipping containers to make this work? Believe it or not, we do. We actually have a modular facility that okay. builds the modular for us, and we and and they secure the shipping containers that are um, going on top of the cans. We have established supply chain to be able to have the same type of construction and um, an efficiency and distribution. Um, in three different parts of the country mm. um, because of our projected growth. So it, it's it's been a very interesting and fun-filled journey of learning for all of us as we become better at the modular game. Um, we made the choice to lead that way. So we obviously are now modular experts. Yeah, sure. I love this concept of efficiency, you know, listeners will probably be sick of this by now, but for us, we've been talking about efficiency all year and I'm sure you've been following this that, you know, Mark Zuckerberg called 2023 the year of efficiency. I mean, the tech industry, of course, efficiency to them has meant layoffs, but there has been sort of this sort of whiplash back to efficiency from sort of the glut of what the last couple of years was, certainly in the tech sector. Um, efficiency is just so important now because with inflation, the way it is, food costs, supply, all these things, you've got to be efficient really to maximize your profitability, of course. This is really key to the small story, clearly, is this idea of efficiency and you said last night it's eight weeks that you it takes you to basically from signing somebody up to dropping the restaurant on their um, on their plot and off they go. Talk well, from me. the moment they have the pad, ready. got the pad, gotcha. Yeah, so we sign a franchise a, a franchisee, and then they have to do the real estate diligence and drop the pad. So once gotcha. the pad is there, we get the can. They put the order for the can. Can arrives, and yes, you're making a cheeseburger slider. Eight to ten weeks later, um, and we are working to reducing that time, which is how we're challenging ourselves to be disruptive in this space. You know, we talked a little bit about this last night, but there's three things that I think about when I think about efficiency. It's easy to talk about labor savings and supply chain and 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 food costs, right? And we all have to do our part there. But efficiency today is simplification. Mm. And simplification is hard. Mm -hmm. You know, we often say the restaurant simple, the restaurant business is simple. Simple is hard. Simple is hard. You know, we on purpose have a simplified menu, and we have to have a lot of discipline to stay that way. Mm -hmm. We're not going to be everything for everybody. That's a choice that we made early on. You know, not just our team here with our board, with Brandon as our founder, and 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 that. Those are hard decisions that then allow us to think through the lens of how do we continue to simplify operations and experience, yet still being relevant because mm -hmm. the consumer today or our guests today are disrupting themselves faster than any brand can disrupt itself. Mm -hmm. And it's telling you very quickly how they want to experience your food, in which environment, Instagrammable is here to stay, 
But that point of connection with a brand requires also a lot of discipline and simplification in your marketing message. And that level of authenticity that requires that you shed all sorts of skins from the things that you've learned in your past lives. So our journey at Smalls is not just control, not, not just you have eight people inside a can and that's all you can fit. And we're going to build a great labor model that anticipates the demand because we want to cook our patties fresh to order. We don't freeze our meat or our pucks. You know, we hand patty them and, and, and make them there. We also want to simplify onboarding processes, recycle processes, you know, do, how do we think about doing good? How do we, how do we do everything from hire to retire somebody? Um, how do we connect with our guests? So everything requires both um, big thinking and a lot of work around simplification. Mm -hmm. So where you're eliminating the bureaucracy out of your four wall operating model, if we can solve for that, then I think we are definitely taking that unicorn dust that I say often we're sitting on and then making it rain. Right. Um, and that's what the team is working on. To do that, we're incredibly committed to digitizing the brand. Mm -hmm. Not by doing more of the same, of course, doing more of the same because we have to, but challenging ourselves to think through the lens of what does the guest need and what does our team member base need? Mm -hmm. So this whole notion of efficiency, it's not going to go away. I don't think it's going to go away in the next two, three years. It's not a fad. It's here to stay. Mm -hmm. It's almost like when you say, I have to purge my house <laughs> and, and, and. That requires a lot of um, innovation mm -hmm. and, and, and and thinking. So that's a fun part of the job today. Yeah. That digitization piece of it, of course, technology becoming so important to all the ways in which restaurants are becoming efficient now. Um, walk me through the that digital strategy mm -hmm. for smalls and and how is that becoming this important? part of the brand. Cause I imagine, especially if you don't even have a dining room, there's a lot of the communication you're doing to your customers is happening. It has to by nature happen digitally. Right. Yeah. So tell me about how you guys are embedding this into the yeah. brand. Well, we think through it through three different lenses. There's what PR and all of what we would call social activity can do for the brand. We have to use those channels effectively to communicate with our current guest space because there's not a lot of ways to do that mm -hmm. outside of, of, of that initial impression. Then there's also how we need to aid our employees to deliver, our squad members to deliver that experience. So it's for us, the roadmap starts with what can we do today that are quick wins? So aggregator, sure. White label, sure. Order a can, sure. Order, um, you know, advanced order, sure. Because we do party packs. Take that to the side. It's what do we need to do to aid throughput, right? So that requires all sorts of time and motion studies. It's not just about labor. It's about throughput mm -hmm. and being able to get better every day on that output. It's also drive-through technology, audio remediation, AI, so many things that are out there at our disposal. But uh, the critical part is how do you simplify ordering, not just a drive-through. Like every drive-through in America, it's going to look different. And that's a that's a challenge mm -hmm. when you're put, making a choice to putting the brand in the hands of your franchisees from day one. So it forces you as a franchisor to have to be so much more buttoned up mm -hmm. to be able to provide the right tools and toolkits to your franchisees so they can deliver a small drive through experience that is unique. And for us, what has always been pretty cool is that because we can be reverent and punchy, you're going to have those unexpected experiences. So we have to build them into your user experience and customer journey. Mm -hmm. So all of that we're mapping out through the digital lens without becoming robots. Yeah, sure. Because the human interaction matters. Yeah. Hospitality matters, right? Exactly. So the exercise is not just to digitize or to aid ourselves to cut labor is actually to enhance experience on a made to order 
fresh patty that you know it's delivered to you in combos right mm. so what the only thing we do we sell is combos and sauces mm. so that's that's important and you know what we're finding is that what we need today mostly does not exist mm. so therefore we have to challenge vendors and partners to aid us um at at, at a ground level and i imagine at the pace you're planning to scale you have to have technology now if it's going to scale with you, right? Correct. And, you know, I I tell our team all the time, you have to think like you have a thousand units. You have to build like you have a thousand units mm -hmm. with, you know, a hundred unit budget. Right. So it requires a lot of conversations with your vendors. They have to believe in the journey. They have to become your partners in the journey. And they have to be willing to be as passionate about the product as you are. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a very interesting road of engineering for us. But we have some brands out there that inspire us every day. I think there's some brands out there doing super cool things. Mm -hmm. Crumble is, you know, disrupting in the product and digital product space. Um, you, you're not going to be like them, but you want to be massively inspired and do it in a way that is meaningful to your brand. Right. Um, so I, I think those are the kind of things that keep us honest along the way. Well, Crumble's a, a good sort of touch point to a point you've made about this one product brand. Mm -hmm. um, and Krispy Kreme was that for you as yes, well. Yes, absolutely. Um, why? What, what What is the opportunity in having a one product brand? What does that give you? What kind of potential exists in that? Well, I learned from my prior leaders at my last brand that um, to deliver an amazing experience, in one product brand, you have to be maniacally obsessed mm. <laughs> and super disciplined. You know, I can tell you that it, that's what I come from and experience the last seven years of almost seven years of my life. Um, I think brands that do it well and that are relevant and most loved. I think Krispy Kreme is one of the most loved sweet treat brands in the world, if not, you know, the most loved. Mm -hmm. And what I think they do incredibly well is the discipline around challenging themselves to be maniacally obsessed in the way they craft their innovation and their product. Of course, great marketers, friends of ours um, on the other side, and then the operations that continues to challenge itself when they're making everything from scratch. So it's it's not that we would ever be that way because we sell something completely different, but we want to be inspired by that discipline in execution. To be a great franchisor in a one product brand, you have to have the operating chops. You can sell it, but you got to be able to build it and you got to be able to support it. So it forces you to stay really connected at a hundred feet, a thousand feet, a 10,000 feet, and the selection process of your franchisees and those who come to play in the sandbox, very important. Right. Yeah. Well, tell me about that. I mean, how are you guys making sure you're having those right franchise partners who you know are going to execute against the vision you you have for this brand? Well, we, we all sell together. You know, every single person in this executive leadership team participates not just on discovery day to sell, but on vetting. And we take time and believe it or not, we say no. Mm -hmm. You know, we I don't feel like we any of us have gone to their head to choose the wrong partner. We do, we tell everybody, look, there's nothing simple about short order cooking 12 hours of the day at the volumes that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a phenomenal operating partner. We want to meet your operating partner. We want to vet your operating partner. We visit in market. We see how people are operating before they come. And also, we're not selling 20 units. We are, are it's a multi-unit system. Five to eight cans per deal. You know, franchisees that want, we want to have relationships in. You know, we're not doing master agreements. This is, we, we have to learn from those who have come before us. And we have to learn from those that did it well and those that didn't do it well. And so we've spent a lot of time studying this model. And, and, and we know it's a, it's, it's a, it feels like the right model for us. What's the ideal franchisee in terms of their past background? Because I know there's 
obviously a lot of franchisees out there who have extensive franchise experience. They have very large brands sometimes in their portfolio. Is that the ideal candidate? Or are you guys looking for somebody maybe new to franchising or smaller scale or what's who's the ideal person? I think our brand presents a unique opportunity. We say that we believe in um, celebrating all the small things. And I do believe that when Brandon... Um, thought about this concept. He also thought about the opportunities, you know, that school of life approach that you can have within the brand. And I think this brand allows us to have all different types of franchisees, um, large operators that have the chops and that can go fast, first time franchisees that need more support um, if we have the ability to support them. Um, but, you know, obviously the financial requirements and the operating requirements are not going to change, meaning you have to have somebody that can operate. The rest we can teach. Mm -hmm. um, so we have a combination of franchisees. We got lucky because at seed level, a lot of our walk ons franchisees also became small franchisees. So they already had operating experience. Now that we are going to market, what we're attracting are experienced franchisees and with a sprinkle of new franchisees. If we feel it's right alignment culturally, because culture matters a lot, mm -hmm. if, if it's the most important thing that we have to preserve that, then we will engage in that relationship. Sure. I personally bet every franchise group, mm. every partner, I'm leaving tomorrow to have those conversations in, in a different state mm. with a franchise group that meet every criteria. I want to spend time with them. Sure. Yeah, you got to know who you're getting into business with, right? Exactly. Yeah, especially in these early days. And also, I mean, I feel like I have to counsel people. Mm. You should you should vet us very, very well. Yeah, yeah <laughs> that's know? a good point. Yeah, so. it's a two-way two -way street. Yeah. Going back to the walk-ons connection, um, you know, obviously Smalls started as with this relationship to walk-ons, but you guys have since you've moved to Atlanta. You're, you're here in Atlanta. Walk-ons is still in Baton Rouge. Um, you, you, you're taking different journeys, but obviously still with the connective tissue of some franchisees who are overlapping. And I imagine the culture has really still permeated from walk-ons over to Smalls. So tell me about, you know, that, that decision to go on kind of Smalls' own journey separate from walk-ons and how you guys plan to still work together, but also keep them apart. So we made the decision early on when I came on board, um, I think it was, Frankly, the night that I agreed to do this it was the the three principles at ten point. Um, Brandon Landry and I we made the decision that the brands would run separately. Um, we felt that the the speed to market and the the two businesses were going to look different and feel different, um, and that we were at a point where we could move the brand to Atlanta, which is what I wanted to do um, very early on. I'd say the connective tissue is what ho what holds the two brands together is Brandon's brain. Yeah. You know, Brandon is uh, just an incredible human being that has so much passion for uh, the concepts that he has created and, and what he, and, and obviously, you know, we have two remarkable concepts that, that have come out of that brain of his. Um, outside of that, we really have our own culture and we really are running the brands completely separate. Um, we are, we're colleagues. We, tr I treat the walk-ons team the same as I would treat the inspired team or the focus team, you know, they're colleagues, but we really do not run the brands together. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, walk-ons, the, the whole idea started because, you know, walk-ons has this amazing slider mm -hmm. played. Mm -hmm. So I, Brandon, thought that he could have a play that was more QSR and that where he could divest and, and really have a one product brand, which was a brilliant idea. Mm -hmm. So um, Brandon is an active board member um, and very active in our product development. Um, one of the things that I told him at the very beginning of the journey is, look, if I can translate your brain in a beautiful way and I can translate the private equity, magical things happen um, when you have great development and great operations, and then you can become a good franchisor. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very fortunate that Drew, Drew Brees mm -hmm. is also heavily involved and very passionate about this. And all of them are super smart and they contribute a lot. So um, I think that's really the connective tissue. Other than that, the brands are just in completely different paths right now. Mm -hmm. 
I imagine there's some legitimacy that walk-ons give smalls as well. Because when I think about emerging brands today, I mean, there's hundreds of them, thousands of them, right? You know, it, there there could be just any old brand. It could have a great product, but sometimes it's really hard to rise above the noise. I imagine walk-ons helps give legitimacy to Absolutely. smalls, opens doors for you. Absolutely. I would say, well, initially, mm -hmm. every door mm -hmm. was open. Um, I think we're standing on our own two feet right mm -hmm. now. Um, I wouldn't say we're running. I'd say, you know, you have to go through the journey of crawling, walking, and running. Um, but every door at the very beginning um, was a walk-on store, uh, particularly in supply chain. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we had commingled supply chain up until a couple of months ago, and they have done a great job aiding and supporting our contracts and our product innovation, et cetera. So, yeah, at the very beginning, I mean, how many people at walk-ons worked in some sort of idea of round smalls back four years ago? So we're forever in that to, to those people that put so much blood, sweat, and tears into this right. project. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's there's this, I think Brandon brings a lot of legitimacy to this situation, you know, prior to any of us coming on board. Mm -hmm. um, he is um, incredibly uh, agile and when it comes to thinking about brands and standing them up. You know, I don't know if you know, he has a third concept in Baton Rouge called Supper Club BTR. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> he can't stop himself. <laughs> he can't stop himself. I, I hear there's an idea in a, in a, in a notebook somewhere, but we are, we are telling him, do not pull it out. Yeah. yeah wait until Smalls has <laughs> wait, reached it. Wait, <laughs> yes, we can't deal with your brain moving so fast. <laughs> he's right. a product guy. He's a product marketer. He's, he's just so creative. Mm. It's fun to work with people that are just so entrepreneurial mm. and, you know, for folks like me, mm. um, it's that don't think that way. It's just very, um, it, it's very inspiring. Mm -hmm. it, it helps you stay agile. You mentioned the word culture and walk-ons is always one of the first brands I think of when I think of culture. And I, I've, I'm shown this video to mul multiple people, but this video of the rumble that happens at walk-ons, yeah, yeah. um, what are some, some lessons you've picked up from the walk-ons culture that you're applying to smalls or you're hoping to carry on from Brandon? Yeah. Well, definitely Wacom's University is so much fun. Mm -hmm. We will have, well, we have Smalls University on paper, but we will have it when we open our new support center <laughs> next year. Uh, we'll we'll bring it to life. Um, you know, I I do think what, I, well, I don't think, what I love about Wacom's, it's how authentic they all are. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this level of authenticity that I believe it's much needed in the space and a lot of brands don't don't have. So that is something that I definitely want to cap capitalize on because I I want to lead a very authentic brand, authentic and transparent brand, both to our consumers, our guests, and frankly, our squad, both here and on the field. Mm -hmm. um, so our squad members are telling us how they expect this culture to work. But for our franchisees, we've been very disciplined that we our partnership, which is the same principle that Walk-Ons uses with their franchisees, and that, um, you know, we're going to be heavily involved. Brandon still goes to reopening. I go to openings. You know, we, we well, while we don't have this founder-led brand here, because Brandon is a board member, not the CEO, um, we stay very connected to make sure that that happens. But to me, the authenticity, the way, you know, they do small, a, a walk on university, the way they pump everybody before an opening, it's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And we, you know, we do have a Super Bowl quarterback, winning quarterback <laughs> right. that, you know, does this with us too. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't heard Drew Brees speak, uh, please go watch a video. He's very inspirational. Yeah. That's a good a good partner to have on your team, yes. for sure. Yes. Um, I want to talk about go back to the cans and talk about yeah. the cans, because this is so unique to Smalls and obviously is going to help really pave the way for you guys in your expansion journey. Um, but tell me about some of the real estate decisions you make with these cans, because in my head, I think to myself, uh, very similar to a lot of what the coffee concepts are doing now, if you just have 800 square feet and you can just pop this thing in, and there's so much open, like, you know, parking lots and, and just these open spaces across the country that you don't need Maine and Maine anymore, I imagine. But what what is your strategy? What do you look for when you want to put a can in a marketplace? What's the ideal spot? So we've been very disciplined about learning uh, as we're looking at all the cans and their performance. 
um, we actually dashboard them like if we own them, right? Mm. We run our dashboards like they were company owned. Um, and we've learned very quickly the real estate that the brand supports for the volumes that we've modeled we want. And believe it or not, it it behaves at a trade. If we can survive with the big boys and girls, mm. Slidell is going to do $2.5 million out of 800 square foot wow. this year. It's already crossed is over six months. So we're way past honeymoon. Mm -hmm. um, and it settled nicely at, at an incredible volume per week next to a Raising Cane's, next to a Chick-fil-A, next to a Panda, literally on the same road at McDonald's. Row. <laughs> and we thought this might not work. We might be murdered. <laughs> and we are holding. Wow. Same thing at Marrero. Same thing at Denham Springs. We're opening in Lafayette next week. It's going to be a monstrous opening. It's We're treating it as a market entry. Um, 100,000 car count in front of that location every day. Wow. So we're preparing for for something that, for a can opening that is going to teach us something mm -hmm. very quickly. And then we follow with um, our first out of state in Flowood, Mississippi, followed by Drew opening his first can in Metairie, which is also at the Clearview Center, which anybody that has landed there. No, mm. it has zero traffic going in front of it. <laughs> so um, we can get away with B. Uh, I would say we're staying away from tertiary right now mm -hmm. on purpose um, because we're learning very quickly um, space and space requirements. The one thing also that I don't want to do is grow the footprint. So um, we are pushing ourselves to to deal with those paths. But yes, fertile ground. I mean, the real estate market is incredibly difficult right now. So we can do carve outs. I mean, that's what we're doing in our second street port location, carving out a portion of a parking lot, working with the developer. You know, there's so many uh, interesting ways of skinning this cat. Yeah. But, well, you know, I think of the last couple of years and the way it's changed the patterns of Americans, right? Their commutes have changed. More people working from home. I see just a lot more empty parking lots anymore, right? And so, you know, kind of similar to like what a company like Reef thought, but maybe prematurely, um, you know, that there's just value in space, yeah. that you can create something out of nothing. It just feels like Smalls is sort of perfectly tailor-made for that, I guess. Um, simultaneously, I can't help but wonder, you know, that there are also challenges to this yeah. strategy. Yeah. Um, First among them, if you don't have a dining room, perhaps you lose some winter business if somebody doesn't want to do a drive through. Tell me what those could be. What are some things you're thinking yeah. through on the challenges of this particular growth strategy? Well, beautification committees <laughs> come to mind. <laughs> um, sometimes people react to, wait, it's a recycled it's a can. can. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh. Is my city going to be pretty enough? And we have to help people understand you know, our ESG strategy. How do we think about doing good? How do we become you know, one with the community? The jobs we're providing, the 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 simplicity of what we're doing, the volume, the taxes. So we've we've had to very quickly learn um, through that. The second, um, a, the second challenge, obviously, is as we expand north, what does it look like for us? We are leading no dining room, mm -hmm. and we have been bullish about it. And we get that question asked all the time. Are you going to do um, stick build? Are you going to do um, dining rooms? Do you need a dining room? So we, we are very much exploring all those things where we are planning all the time is we really don't want to do a dining room if we don't have to <laughs> mm -hmm. but how do we enclose patio what's the purpose of the patio does every can have a patio you know how do we think about double drive throughs so absolutely there's a lot of that without becoming one more in the sea of sameness yeah. i mean there's a parallel to your menu right yes. the, this idea of one product brand there's value in one real estate model mm -hmm. brand too, right? Because yes. it's like if Smalls has some consistency in what people know it to be, once it gets national status, yes. people under they have an expectation, I guess, for what they're getting at. Yeah, of. correct. Well, you're teaching people how to utilize you as well. Mm -hmm. You know, in the same way you're listening intently to your customer and your guest base um, from day one. Uh, right. One of the first things we did when I got here was we need to stand up an insights capability on a guest feedback loop. I got to understand how people are experiencing us and what they're saying about us, um, not just from the from a product lens, but just total experience. 
Um, I do believe that there is value in locking the model mm -hmm. and making sure that we learn very quickly how we need to challenge ourselves to stay relevant um, without adding additional square footage. And a lot of it, we, we count 12 items a week, 12. Hmm. Yeah. So <laughs> there's value in that. <laughs> right, right. You know. Well, you know, getting into the menu, um, I know that right now uh, there's obviously real pressure to drive traffic to stores yeah. because traffic's been really difficult for the restaurant industry in the last several months and, and years. Um, and there's been a lot of action on the menu uh, for a lot of brands, value menus, product innovation, LTOs, whatever it is. Um, how do you guys approach the menu in that way? If your menu is your best marketing tool because of the you know quality of the flavor and all that, but you're also committed to this one product kind of strategy, what's the right compromise between those two things? There are there are pockets within our menu where we feel we have an opportunity to extend. Um, called indulgence comes to mind. Mm. Every strategy. I mean, we sell amazing milkshakes that people don't know about. Right. Mm -hmm. So what does the perfect pairing looks like? The combination? What does a real combo look like? Do you is it just always a soda or is it proprietary sodas or is it, you know, milkshake, LTOs? What does that look like? So we're going through that product development right now. Mm -hmm. Um and also Biggie Smalls. Biggie Smalls stands on its own. That double puck cheeseburger slider mm -hmm. that is obviously almost like a quarter pounder mm -hmm. uh, at bacon we have our secret language on how you order and top it and crunchify it i think there's an opportunity to do that and you know i don't think a lot of people recognize today that our sliders are meant to be dunked in sauce mm. so mm. you know we brandon needs them a certain way right so he dunks his in ketchup i dunk mine in small so there's all of those um add-ons that we have mm. to our menu that we can continue to innovate. I think the big question we have to ask ourselves is what do we do with non-beef and you know that consumer base that today we're not attracting. But we are clear that we're not going to do chicken, we're not going to do pork, we're not going to do all of that. Right. We so so I do think there's an opportunity for us to do that. Our Nobody knows about our kids' menus. We do have them. Mm. You know, we do have a value component within our menus. So a lot of it is continuing our education and being more precise in how we are um, handling drive through and, and the menu composition to the guest. Right, right, right. Well, I, sliders are kind of hot right now. I mean, you know, Smalls is not the only concept to have arrived at that uh, conclusion that this is a real opportunity. Um, and as I understand it, the big part of this is because of the variety that sliders can offer, right? So, I mean, is that something you guys are targeting too? Is that part of the message of sliders are good for variety or is the message sliders are good for if you're dieting and you want just a smaller portion? Like what's the right <laughs> message around sliders? Sliders are good for tailgating and feeding a lot of people. Whatever I need to tell myself. Yes. I think sliders are good for you to do all sorts of things, things, mm -hmm. cheat at the, at the drive through, you know have a, a community party, yep. bring it to the office. You know, our party bags are 50 sliders deep and they sell like crazy. I'm sure. So uh, it's it's just, it's a, you're handling the food. It's a tiny cheeseburger mm -hmm. and it's super satisfying and craveable. So for us, I our message has been around, it's this big and you're going to love it. And you're going to want more. So buy three, buy four, buy 10. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's not about, do you want to lose weight yet? <laughs> <laughs> it's not about, uh, you know, do you want to top it with four different things? Um, but, you know, we have great fries and and, and we, we, we really are just leading with the cheeseburger slider as the oracle of what we're doing. Gotcha. But it's it's a fun, fun combo. I mean, you order two, three, four, and you're going to be very satisfied. Right, right, right. Okay. So looking into the future, uh, you know, you were telling me before we hit record, you guys have many, many deals that you're about to announce. And maybe by the time folks are listening to this, that's already happened. Um, but clearly there's a lot of demand for smalls from the franchise community. Clearly this is something that is, is going to resonate. I mean, it's hard to imagine slider burgers, not really resonating in communities across America. But 
well, for starters, I guess, was it important to get this all right before you set that pace of growth? I mean, imagine you had to have this all prepared before you guys go off and running. Tell me about that process. Absolutely. Um, at the onset of the relationship between Ten Point and this is before I got here, and and Brandon and Drew, uh, everything we halted everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we halted franchising. At that point, the the company had forty units under development, which is not insignificant, and we stopped everything. We had to get our operating capabilities and our team in place to be able to support that. So we locked ourselves for months, getting everything ready, operating manuals, training materials, how we train, what do we do? I mean, listening to our franchisees, it's not perfect yet. We're learning every day, but we have to come back and fix that very quickly. Mm -hmm. And we don't have months. So the agility that this team has to have to be able to continuously support that. It's great. It's a good problem to have and solve for. We feel very blessed. On the other hand, I also have to throttle this because, you know, as the leader of the business, ultimately, if we're not ready, we're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And and when I don't feel we're ready, we s slow the machine down. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we're keeping nicely on our pace. Yes, we're about to announce a lot of deals and um, a, I'm super happy for those future franchisees and our new partners in, in the journey. Um, and also it's making me reflect on all the other things that we have to do to ensure that we can keep up the right way with our growth. Mm -hmm. um, and also there's this balance, right? Nobody is trying to do this at a pace that it's not good for us. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not here on a rat race either. So we're in control of that. Mm -hmm. And when we need to slow down, we do. Because we've mentioned Crumble already in this conversation. So I think using them as a, as a good parallel, we've watched them double year over year in size yeah. and remarkable. Um, I've had an opportunity to talk to Jason McGowan, uh, you know, founder there, just about how do you do that without let the wheels just falling off of this thing? How do you not get ahead of your skis? And, you know, there's a number of the things that they're they're doing there, but I guess I'd ask the same question of you because there, there is this opportunity that you could go from four locations to 200 locations in the span of less than two years. How do you do that without it just falling apart and everything starting to become chaotic? How do you ensure that the pace of growth is, uh, is appropriate to mm -hmm. what the system can handle? I stay very present and very connected to my entire team. Mm -hmm. And that is not just our ELT. That's every manager that works here because the system will tell you mm -hmm. and you have to listen. You, when you see your franchisees strained, when they're having a bad day, when you're visiting the can, when they say, can I talk to you <laughs> or text you? Mm -hmm. It's telling you if you're ready for something or not. When you listen intently and you're become much more vulnerable as a CEO. I do think that you at that point can reflect constantly on what your system needs. For us is if our operations are not ready, then we have to slow down the sales process. If our operations are waiting, then we can accelerate it. Our marketers doing the operating capabilities of every function have to be there. Mm -hmm. I talk to my ELT every day. Um, we, I listen to their concerns. I listen to when they say, I got, I, I'm, I'm strained and can we solve for it? Do, can we buy the capability? Can we engage the right partner? Then great. When the answer is no, then we have to, you know, just simply say, okay, we're not, we're not going to do that mm -hmm. particular activity this month. We've also established PMO very quickly. Um, so we have digitized all our PMO. And we can tell you by day today how many activities are happening in the system. How many openings? How many can drops? How, how much Coca-Cola syrup we're going to need? And that requires that this team stays very connected. I tell the team, we're building the Abu Dhabi and we're on floor three. And you cannot put that cinder block before your peer 
<laughs> is not dropping whatever they need. Mm -hmm. So you have to constantly force them to talk, to communicate, to collaborate, to travel together, to to spend time. Because if 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 marketing leaves operations behind, if operations is not keeping up with development, it does fall apart. Mm -hmm. The other part is you have to, as a leader, be more agile and nimble. I mean, there is something to be said about having the right contract labor, having the right interns, feeding from non-traditional areas, your pool of shared meaning. We've learned so much from our college students. Mm. They crossed over from LSU. Mm -hmm. I mean, they tell you, they're not only using your brand, they our fans, you know, our newest LTO that I'm not going to tell you what it is because it's we're announcing it next week, came from LSU students that mm. wanted that blend. Mm. You got to listen. You got to listen. Yeah. So um, I think every brand has to follow their own path and journey. But mm -hmm. the great leaders that I've had have always taught me, listen to your consumer, pay close attention. Um, and, you know, I'm very fortunate that I've had the opportunity to work with some great minds in this industry mm -hmm. that I, I, I keep telling myself every self and what would so-and-so do? <laughs> so. <laughs> So this opportunity, obviously, um, you're already off and running in this position. Clearly, um, there's a great buzz about this brand. Um, what's your vision for it? I mean, when you think about, say you're here five years, 10 years, 15, 20, forever, whatever. But at some point, Maria leaves Smalls mm -hmm. for whatever reason. Well, it will happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's some at some point. That's just a fact of life. How do you hope to have left it at that point? I want to be able to build a brand. First of all, I want to be able to tell the right story about the brand. I think that, you know, at this point, you know, hopefully I'm aging gracefully, um, that we tell the brand with integrity and um, with purity because Brandon and the team deserve that. Everybody that put blood, sweat, and tears prior, they deserve that. They deserve to for this to be told the right way. That's number one. Two, I want to leave behind a a much more, um, I'm going to use the word elegant, but I don't mean it in that context, you know, higher thought partners at the table when it comes to the leadership team. The leadership team matters and building the right leadership team matters. I have prided myself in building remarkable teams through my career. This team that we are building is incredibly special. We went on national searches through three different firms. We caught the best talent supported by capital partners that said, go build and go build a phenomenal team. And I feel we've done that. Mm -hmm. We all feel very confident that, you know, this, these folks are going to challenge our thinking. And I think for me, I, I need both thought partners, people that are going to challenge me and people that are going to accelerate. So I want to, I want to see the next CEO come from, from this room of people. Mm. And I mean, I want to be able to see the brand sustained, you know, I don't want to build a brand that fizzles, you know, I want to look at the brand when I'm driving in my car down the road and go, oh my God, you know, it's mm -hmm. there. It's, you know, you have those moments of truth, you know, I've worked for, for incredibly iconic brands, Walt Disney Company, and, you know, obviously most recently Krispy Kreme, and you want to be able to look back and say, we, we've we left it in a better place than when we found it. Mm -hmm. For us, one thing is to, of course, being on the growth side is remarkable. It's fun. It's also remarkably hard, mm -hmm. uh, but it's fun and it keeps you young in the head. Um, but yeah, that's what I hope for the brand. I have big aspirations. Yeah. You know, the people love burgers. It's one of the most beloved foods in America. And um, if we can, if we can, not getting our own way, then that's a great part of our legacy as yeah, well. Yeah, that's good. Last question for you, Maria. Um, I asked this question last night, and I, I really liked your answer for it. And it was, um, you know, just to provide some tips for emerging restaurant operators who are looking to scale their business. Because you're, you're doing this at a turbocharged pace. But regardless, you're going through a process now with Smalls that countless have come before you and done the same thing, where they've taken this small kernel of an idea and watched it grow. And many countless others will do the same. Many folks who are listening to this right now might be in the same boat. What's your advice to them? What are some tips you can leave in terms of for those who are looking to scale their business, the things they should be doing now to be ready for that process? Well, I said it last night, and I'm not going to change my answer uh, because I'm I firmly believe that 
humility plays a big part in all of this. I don't care who you are, where you come from, your education, how many master's degrees do you have. The leadership team in an emerging concept has to stay humble mm -hmm. and it has to um, be for each other. And the greatest teams that I've ever worked on have cared deeply about one another. They don't stab each other on the back. They, you know, so, so I think that's important. Building a team and, and a culture, you as the leader, that does not allow that you know, that, that has boundaries around being there for one another. The other part, there's no arrogance or ego allowed in the room because again, I don't care who you are and where you come from. Hopefully if you've done your job right, you have very smart people, mm -hmm. so way smarter people than you in the room. But if you allow any of that to come in, it's, it's going to build a toxic environment and your growth is going to slow. It, it's, 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 you're, you're really going to, you know, shoot yourself in the foot. Mm -hmm. um, the other part is, you know, phone a friend, pick up the phone. There's so many bright minds out there. I can tell you that the last six months for me here, doing a this, taking this from true seed to emerging, um, I wouldn't be here without CEO friends, um, operating partners of private equities, just my incredible network that I know I can call at any mm -hmm. given point, and they're going to say, how can I help? Mm -hmm. And how can I help your team? I mean, how many texts I get from congratulations on this great appointment. Um, I had a, I have a, a good friend of mine that is an incredible CMO that said, oh my God, congratulations on Michael. Tell me how I can help him. Mm -hmm. There are so many bright minds. So you have to stay open and not think you can wear a cape and do it all mm -hmm. and empower your team. You know, I say I have six jobs, right? Establish the culture, be the culture driver, never run out of cash, you know, <laughs> select the right team, give them the right tools, get the hell out of their way. That's important and calibrate when needed. <laughs> so if I do that all in a day and I do hopefully all those things in a day, then I've done my job right. You That's know. awesome. Oh, I love that. Maria Rivera, uh, CEO of Small Sliders. I really appreciate your time. Oh my thank God. You. Thank you so much. And thank you to you, to the team. It's always so fun to spend time with our partners at Nations Restaurant News. I appreciate it. Thanks, Maria. Thank you. For generations, Butterball has delivered only quality American grown turkey. They provide products that please patrons while delivering versatility to operators in all segments. But Butterball doesn't stop there. As an organization, they're always looking for ways to empower operators to be at their best. From recipes that inspire culinary creativity to insights and trends that can help drive business decisions, it's all at ButterballFoodService.com. That was my interview with Smalls Sliders CEO, Maria Rivera. So what should you learn from this interview? Here are my eight takeaways. My first takeaway is that there is power in one product brands. As Maria shared, she's very passionate about one product brands. She came from Krispy Kreme, where the one product is, of course, donuts. She is now here at Smalls, where the one product is sliders. Of course, variations on these products, but a laser focus on the menu and not expanding too wildly out from what that core product is. As Maria shared, you know, you can really concentrate your development and your messaging around that one product, which can help you be uh, very disciplined and very, as she says, maniacally obsessed with the quality of the product and with the messaging of what you're sharing with your customers. That's why she thinks one product brands can be iconic because you can go all in on that one thing, be obsessive about its quality and how you're communicating it to your guests, and you can stay disciplined and authentic with that. Of course, the challenge is, as she said, if you're only going to have one product, it has to be the most craveable product out there. So another brand we talk a lot about in this interview was Crumble Cookies. Crumble has become explosive in its growth and is really owning the cookie segment. Smalls aims to really own the slider segment. Krispy Kreme can own the donut segment. All of that is because you really have to have that one craveable product everybody wants and talks about. 
My second takeaway is that a great founder plus great financial partner plus great product equals great opportunity. Uh, you know, some brands might have two of those three components, one of those three components, but you really have to have all three locked in if you're going to become a very successful restaurant chain. That was what Maria saw in Small's Sliders when she decided to take the CEO job. She saw a great founder in Brandon Landry, a visionary who's already succeeded with walk-ons. A great financial partner in 10 Point Capital, which was, again, one of Walk-On's uh, investors. But she also see, saw that great product in the sliders that Smalls was selling. And she saw those components coming together to be an engine to Smalls growth and to be really the heart of Smalls growth. As I said before earlier, Maria is really kind of brought in to be the brains now. It's her task to scale this thing, build out the operations, build out the team but she's got those three pieces in place to really make that a, an easier job for her. My third takeaway is that modular store construction is the efficient expansion strategy of the future. I love how Smalls is approaching its expansion with these shipping container units. Uh, Maria got into it, so I won't uh, you know waste your time talking about what these units are like, but they're built off-site, brought in, dropped on the plot, 27 minutes from the time it's brought in to the time that you can flip it on the open sign and customers can start coming through. That's incredibly efficient. Eight to 10 weeks from the time you have the plot to the time you have your restaurant if you're a franchisee. We've been talking about efficiency all year at NRN and how important it is to find these efficiencies. And this strategy for growth is is the definition of efficiency because it allows them to grow so quickly. They can find these parking lots or other plots that may be unused and stand up a restaurant in no time compared to a typical restaurant. And that's going to help them achieve this explosive growth they think could be possible. My fourth takeaway is that efficiency is simplification and simplification is hard. So that's the <laughs> downside of efficiency. Again, we talk a lot about efficiency, but the problem is efficiency can be very hard. Look, you've probably heard the saying, restaurants are simple and simple is hard. Same idea. Efficiency is simple and simple is hard. Sim uh, efficiency is about simplifying things uh, so that you can have better profitability um, that you can save on time, save on labor, but that requires uh, laser focus. It requires incredible discipline. And as Maria talked about in our interview, it requires you to say no to things you may have said yes to before, especially if you're coming in from a different company and you have experience with other ways of doing things. Being efficient and, and simplifying things, it means you cannot get off that straight and narrow. You have to really narrow that focus and, and say no to all of these other things that could be so tempting and could be so promising, but are not uh, efficient as you want them to be. So efficiency, it's simplification and it's great, but it is hard. My fifth takeaway is that if you're planning fast expansion, make sure your vendors are willing to come on that journey with you. Smalls has big, big plans. I mean, we're talking thousands of units kind of plans, and they only have eight restaurants today all in Louisiana. But to get to a thousand locations or beyond, obviously you have to scale these systems that they have in place now, which means they're not thinking like an eight unit brand. Maria says they're thinking like a thousand unit brand on a 100 unit brand budget, which I, I thought was an interesting tidbit. You know, she said that you, you have to have lots of conversations with your vendors. You have to get, make sure your vendors are as passionate about your brand and product as you are. And if you have those things in place, they will be prepared to go on that journey with you from eight to a thousand locations and beyond, but make sure they are there and ready for that journey. My sixth takeaway is that a sister brand to a successful concept can ride its coattails to a point. The relationship between Smalls and Walk-Ons is really fascinating. Again, you have Brandon Landry, the founder. You have Drew Brees, Brandon's friend and a board member and visionary in his own right. Um, and, and they are some of the common pieces behind both of these brands. Uh, and in the early days, Smalls really benefited from all the doors that Walk-Ons was able to open, from supply chain to vendors to all of these things. Uh, but Maria knew eventually Smalls would have to set out on its own path. That's why she moved it from Baton Rouge to Atlanta. She wanted to treat it as its own concept, and that's really benefiting Smalls immensely. It's not getting lost in Walk-On's shadow. Still, they're able to pull from Walk-On's culture. They're able to pull from Walk-On's innovation and ideation. Uh, but Maria is very dead set on now creating that path for Smalls. She used a good case study, which was fellow Atlanta restaurateurs, focus brands, and inspire brands. 
They are one company with multiple concepts under that umbrella. And that's how she sees that relationship with walk-ons and smalls. You can have shared services. You can benefit from the relationships you have within the organization, but you must pursue your own journey. My seventh takeaway is that a vulnerable, accessible CEO has a sense of how quickly a brand can grow. Uh, I got to tell you, being at Small's headquarters, meeting several of the Small's team members, it's it's amazing the kind of uh, reverence and respect they have for Maria. She is clearly an incredibly dynamic leader. But as she said, I mean, she's accessible. She was very easy to talk to. She was right there for her teammates. She says she's happy to text with folks, with franchisees. She's vulnerable. She's open. She's honest, as I'm sure you heard from this interview. All of these things help her to be that leader who can, who has their finger on the pulse of the growth strategy at Smalls. They have big, big plans and ambitions, but without Maria being that uh, vulnerable CEO, it could go nowhere. By listening to her people and understanding all of the ins and outs of the system, Maria is able to step on the accelerator or step on the brake whenever she needs to. And I think that's really important so that Smalls doesn't get out over its skis and expand too quickly. My eighth and final takeaway, and I promise you I could have had dozens and dozens more from this conversation, is that emerging brand leadership teams must stay humble to build a healthy company. Same idea uh, as that last point I made about Maria. She, She closed our interview with that thought, that if you are building your own restaurant concept, if you're part of an emerging restaurant team, you need humility. Don't have be a part of a system where you're stabbing each other in the back. Don't be a part of a company where there's ego or arrogance. The team needs to be there for each other. They need to care deeply about each other. They need to support each other and be humbled and recognize that you're all in it together. If you do those things, you're going to do the right things for the company, for the brand, and for the people. Ultimately, if you don't have those things, as she said, you're going to have a toxic culture. Those are all my takeaways for today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please remember to subscribe to Takeaway wherever you listen to podcasts and leave your feedback. You can also email me at sam.okus at informa.com. Thanks again and talk to you next week.